Hello, good morning, good evening, namaste. This is Dr. Ravi Shankar Polisati. Um, you must have already heard about me uh, through various channels. And the fact that you're watching this video means that you wanted to, you know, sign up for the polyscientific Ayurvedic treatment and uh, you wanted to know what we do uh, during the entire course of polyscientific Ayurvedic treatment. So friends, I'm a heart surgeon by training. I'm trained uh, as an MD physician from the VTEPS government medical university from Belarus uh, between 1989 and 1996. After which, you know, I worked in Puttaparthi Satisai um, institution as a screening cardiologist. And then, you know, I took up uh, cardiac surgery as my training and I'm trained cardiac surgeon with, uh, and uh, a member of European Association of Cardiothoracic Surgeons and several other, you know, uh, cardiac uh, surgery uh, associations across the world, including the Pediatric Cardiac Society of India. I'm also trained as a naturopathic doctor, ND, and um, uh, I have a doctorate in natural medicine, DNM from Canada. I'm undergoing my BAMS course right now. I'm a Python programmer and a Watson data scientist and a uh, I, I have a postgraduate uh, certificate from the University of Texas, Austin in the data science program and AI and ML technologies. So this is me, friends. You know, why did it take as long as it took, you know, for what I became? Uh, I'll, I'll tell you very quickly about uh, what prompted me to uh, perform research in Ayurveda. It was a very amateur thinking, uh, possibly, you know, in the middle of my medical school days, you know, especially when pharmacology started, I was really scared. I was really scared looking at the quantum of side effects that each of the drugs would produce in the body. And uh, when I read, you know, death could be one of the side effects, I was really scared. I didn't want to, you know, become a, a merchant of death. You know, we, we all, you know, we as doctors, we never want to be that. We really want to help our patients. We really want to serve the needy. We really want to serve the, serve the ailed. But then, you know, when I looked at these side effects, outweighing the benefits by at least seven to ten times, I was really scared. And I started looking at an alternative way of understanding the body and alternative way of treatment. And because I did my schooling from Sri Satisai Vidya Vihar, Hyderabad, I was uh, taught the Bhagavad Gita, the Upanishads by the grade nine. You know, we were already well versed with Upanishads, the Dvaita, Dvaita, Visishta Dvaita uh, philosophies of India proposed by the uh, Madhvacharya, Ramanujacharya and the Shankaracharya. Actually, it's, it's the Dvaita, Visishta Dvaita and Advaita, Advaita concepts proposed by them correspondingly. And uh, also well versed with uh, Upanishads and uh, at least the gist of them. And then Bhagavad Gita, we learned it by rote, you know, because of our beautiful and excellent uh, spiritually oriented teachers from the Sri Satyasavidya Vihar. With all this training and with the scare that the pharmaceutical drugs have created in me, I started reading the uh, scriptures of Ayurveda in the original Sanskritam. And when I started reading Ayurveda in the translations, I quickly figured that the, the translations were looking very, very primitive and I quickly figured out uh, because uh, Bhagavan Shri Satyasai Babaji always used to tell us that, you know, Sanskrit is a Nava Vyakarana Bhasha. Nava Vyakaranas are the nine grammars. They're translated as the nine grammars. You know, every language has a set of grammar principles. If you look at English, you know, English is guided by over 900 plus uh, grammar principles, all documented in the Renan Martin grammar book. Uh, the Hindi has about 1700 grammar principles. The uh, Telugu language uh, is guided by, you know, over 1600 grammar principles. They're called as the Chando Vyakaranas. And uh, uh, every language has a set of grammar principles. But Sanskritam has nine sets of grammar principles, friends. And uh, uh, cumulatively, uh, there are over 200,000 grammar principles in the Sanskrit Bhasha. 3,996 grammar principles are there in Paniniya grammar. In all, the nine grammars are the Indram, Aindram, Sandram, Shakalam, Shakadainam, Kashakrutsnam, Kaumarakam, Paniniyam, and uh, Saraswatam, friends. So Saraswatam itself has about 93 thousand grammar principles. Aindram grammar is defined by over 25,000 shlokas. Uh, you see, you know, the quantum of uh, grammar principles that our ancient scientists of language used to write these scriptures. So each syllable in Sanskritam would have about nine meanings at least, you know, by applying each of these principles from 
uh, each of these grammars. So if a word has two syllables, then it would have over 81 meanings. French. That's how beautifully the scientists of Sanskrit language have, uh, you know, communicated a very, very effective way of communication. So when I figured this out and then started applying these principles, I, I, I'm not claiming that I know all of the grammars, but I certainly have introduction to the Paniniya grammar, the Sarasvatam, the Aindram, the Kashakrutsnam grammars. Uh, the rest of the grammars are like, I wouldn't know where they are, but they, they should be there somewhere. But, you know, applying these grammar principles to understand uh, the scriptures has given me a beautiful way of understanding the whole body. That's point number one, friends. And number two is, you know, then I realized that health is defined in Ayurveda is, uh, uh, it talks about samadosha. There are three doshas in Ayurveda, the vata, the pitta and the kapha. So these three, these three agents of vata, pitta and kapha are derived from the pancha bhautika tattvas which are called as the primordial elements. So these are the bhutatva, jalatattva, agni, vayu and akasha tattvas uh, which translate into the earth element the uh, water element, the fire element, the air element and the space element. And please don't get confused between the earth that we see, that we inhabit and uh, the earth element because the earth element is the field because of which the earth is formed. The earth is formed with 50% of the earth element and 12.5% of each of the other elements, friends. So this is again a big Vedantic topic, you know, which I will not delve here, where this is just an intro of uh, what is uh, Ayurveda. So these Panchabhutas, because of various reasons, combine to form the Vata, Pitta and the Kapha. The, the earth element and the water element combine to form the Kapha. The ma majorly fire element and uh, ma to a minor extent the Jalatattva or the water element and the air element combine to form the Pitta and uh, the Vayu Tattva and Akasha Tattva, the, which means the air element and the space element combined to form the Vata. So what the Rishis are propounding is that when the, there is Sama Doshaha, when the three doshas are in equal proportion in each of the seven tissues and 42 organs, uh, then the body automatically restores a certain balance in the body. It becomes a self-healing machine and cures its own self and results in swastya. This is very, very important. Why? Because in allopathy, we, we really have a problem. See, today, well, according to which guidelines are you diabetic is a big question. Do you have to intensely lower your glucose values by giving uh, intense uh, hypoglycemic or anti-diabetic drugs or do you, you don't have to? According to the VADT trial, the Va Veterans Affairs Diabetic Trial, 9.5 should be the average of uh, glycated hemoglobin. That's what this trial has demonstrated, that when they, these veterans were you know, uh, subjected to intense glucose lowering therapy, they had several other side effects, several other symptoms that were unwanted. And, uh, you know, according to the American College of Physicians, based on the ACCORD trial and several other trials, including the ADVANTAGE trial, they set the uh, limits of the gl uh, glycated hemoglobin between 7 and 8. The uh, American Diabetic Association comes up with a number uh, which says 6.5 or lower should be the value of HbA1c and 5.5 was uh, propounded by the endocrinologist. So according to which association are you diabetic is a big question. So whose uh, recommendations do you follow in your patients is a big question. The same goes with the lipid therapy. The same goes with several other blood biochemical parameters. And here in Ayurveda, what I found was interesting was that these three agents of vata, pitta, kapha should be in equal proportion in each of the seven tissues and 42 organs. When it does, you end up with physical, mental, emotional, spiritual and uh, um, social well-being. In the scriptures, it is mentioned as sama dosha, sama agnishta, sama dhatu malakriya, prasin atma manasi indriyanam swastya ittibidhiyate. So, swastya is uh, absolute state of health, is achieved when you end up, when you try to balance this, uh, this dosha. Sama dosha means balancing of these three doshas. When you balance them, you end up with absolute health is what the scientists of uh, Ayurveda are saying. So now the problem is, what are these vata, pitta and kaphas? What are they? You know, if you go by the Ayurvedic uh, understanding, vata has about seven properties. Vata is characterized by seven properties. Pitta by, and kapha by seven properties each approximately. So vata is characterized by something called rukshana, dryness, khara, uh, roughness, uh, um, daru, uh, stiffness, um, 
and lagu, light, uh, chalatva, penetrating. I mean, this coming from an allopathic perspective, these explanation of properties doesn't really make big sense. At least that didn't make much sense to me at the time when I was reading. But then, you know, when I started reading the scriptures on chemistry, biochemistry, phytochemistry, advanced uh, quantum biochemistry, pharmaceutical chemistry and advanced pharmaceutical quantum chemistry, you know, th these are the layers that I figured out are already available in Ayurveda. When they said in the scriptures that Ashitis Chattva Lakshara Samritam Swasthiti Bidhiyati, what it means is 84 lakh biochemicals are actually maintaining your health is what Ayurvedic scriptures have already dealt with and already come up with and they have beautifully characterize each of these uh, chemicals in in several books uh, spanning over you know uh, approximately 2.7 million verses so friends it is like definitely for you know for doctors like you and me allopathic doctors especially for scientists you know it's going to be a mind-boggling number how did these scientists know all of that that is already documented that was the first question that I had so what in a nutshell the ancient biochemistry dealt with over 8.4 million chemicals and they have given clearly the solubility profile of each of these chemicals Jalaja Navalakshani which means the water soluble chemicals are 9 lakhs Sthavara Vimshati Lakshani which means 20 lakh chemicals are non-reactive Gritam Chaturasi Lakshani which means uh, 400,000 chemicals are fat soluble and I mean the entire solubility profile of all the chemicals is given. So today friends, you know, you, you look at, you know, you, you, you look at Harper's biochemistry or any other book on biochemistry, we are taught that the body is comprised of only 7 million chemicals and we, today we are discovering over 12 to 20 chemicals every day in the body, new chemicals and the solubility profile of only 900,000 chemicals is known. So friends, you know, there's a lot of gap. How did we arrive at this gap? Where did this gap come from? I don't know. But what I can certainly say is that this, there's a beautiful logic given. So what the scientists are, what the ancient Ayurvedic scientists were saying or the rishis were saying was that so many chemicals make up your body. But then these chemicals participate in several trillions of interactions. 32 trillion is the number that is given. So uh, out of which uh, over 10.7 uh, trillion or approximately 11 trillion chemical 11 trillion chemical interactions guide the vata pathways 11 trillion guide the pitta and as, uh, the rest of the 10.7 approximately trillion pathways or chemical interactions guide the kapha pathways or it's it's the other way around the vata guides the 10.7 trillion chemical interactions in the body the pitta and the 10.7 the kapha 10.7 approximately so so you, so you see where I'm coming from or where, where I want you to understand, what I want you to understand is that Vata, Pitta, Kapha guide several millions and millions of chemical reactions and several chemical interactions. There's a clear cut difference between a chemical reaction which is given by the word Rasayana Charya and chemical interaction, Rasayana Karsha. So there is a beautiful syntax friends, you know, without understanding the original import of these uh, words, you know, we will not be able to get into uh, the un actual understanding of what rishis were trying to communicate to us. Initial 10 years, you know, starting from 1991 to 2001 were, were actually spent on Understanding the scriptures in the original Sanskritam and I would say friends is a very very advanced science for sure there's no doubt about it. It has given me a beautiful understanding of the body, the, uh, the way uh, different chemical reactions are correlated, how they are compensated and how they are triggered by these, uh, these different agents of Vata, Pitta and Kapha. So what, what we did was then, you know, starting from 2002 onwards, we started correlating Vata, Pitta, Kapha with, uh, you know, uh, allopathic medicine. How did we do that? We created models of Vata, Pitta, Kapha in experimental animals and then started measuring uh, action potentials. Electrophysiology studies were, were, were done extensively and what we really found was Vata triggers hyperexcitability in the tissues, Pitta triggers spontaneous reactivity of the tissues and Kapha makes the tissues hypo excitable. It's really interesting. Why? Because for the first time, doshas were modeled in experimental animals and we were able to come up with some data correlating Vata, Pitta, Kapha with electrophysiology. Later we did studies on interleukins and then correlated six of the interleukins. I mean, those were the reagents that were available with me at that time when we did the research. This research is ongoing, friends. We have partnered with several institutions right now, several universities, and this uh, correlational research is still going on. 
So what I'm trying to say is that these three agents for sure do exist. As a doctor, you need to actually identify the proportions of each of these uh, doshas in individual organs, in individual tissues, which is possible. How is it possible is what I'm going to explain now. What happens when these three agents, you know, are detected and then, you know, you give appropriate diets and appropriate uh, exercise and breathing exercise and physical exercise regimen, what happens is the body sets itself into a self-healing mode and cures itself. And we proved this also. For the first time in 2009, I was able to demonstrate subtotal regeneration of the heart tissue in a post-MI scenario in experimental rats. And then later our study is continued on you know demonstrating the efficacy of you know the VPK balancing therapy in ischemic uh, stroke model in experimental animals and also in you know partial nephrectomy models uh, subtotal pancreatectomy models and also you know subtotal hepatectomy models so we are we're pretty convinced that in experimental models you know we were able to demonstrate that the three doshas when they are balanced uh, they, they lead to automatic you know regeneration of tissues was proved and we are like filed several patents on that friends i demonstrated lectured in various conferences various congresses and uh, in several conclaves i even presented this in the who summit that happened in the december of 2018 this is a quick intro of what we did in the last 30 years so what further we did was in the last 20 years we were able to translate this entire concept of balancing of the dosha therapy in end stage patients we specially chose those subjects uh, who are actually left off from the mainstream uh, allopathic uh, clinical intervention clinical or surgical or whatever intervention we have they are excluded from the uh, current allopathic form of medication and uh, only when you know end up with end stage heart disease like if you have a ihd patients with ischemic cardiomyopathy and is if a, if, if if the ef is less than 30 or you know a, a refractory or a you know, very aggressive cancer that is not uh, improved in spite of you know, your aggressive MAB and uh, chemotherapy and radiation therapy or even surgical therapy if surgery was indi indicated or steroid refractory asthma, steroid refractory allergies uh, or you know uh, refractory diabetes and several autoimmune diseases. We were able to demonstrate uh, improved quality of life and improved uh, symptom free survival and in at least 70% of the patients we were able to achieve total independence from allopathic and also our Ayurvedic supplements. So how does this happen is what we're going to tell now.